Once again, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I'm sorry, I forgot my eyeglasses, so I, I, I couldn't read clearly. I didn't know what I'm doing. So, but don't tell anybody this secret. Oh, did you record it? That makes it more of a secret now. Because it's recorded, it means it's kept secret. Anyway, <coughs> we finished with a number 157, Surah Al-Baqarah. And uh, we are turning to another section from Surah Al-Baqarah, from ayah number 158. We know that that section that we finished last time uh, was done with the ayah 157, أُولَٰئِكَ عَلَيْهِمْ صَلَوَاتٌ مِنْ رَبِّهِمْ وَرَحْمَةٌ Those patient ones who receive well the qada and the qadr of Allah, they receive it with acceptance and they receive it with commitment to continue to live within the bounds of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, أُولَٰئِكَ عَلَيْهِمْ صَلَوَاتٌ مِنْ رَبِّهِمْ وَرَحْمَةٌ Those certainly do have mercy from Allah and they have his support. Uh, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bestows his mercy on someone, this is what is called salah. When we say, Allahumma salli ala Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, it means we are invoking Allah's mercy to be bestowed upon Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. وَأُولَٰئِكَ هُمُ الْمُهْتَدُونَ Those are the guided ones. Next ayah, ayah 158. <coughs> Excuse me. إِنَّ الصَّفَى وَالْمَرْوَةَ مِنْ شَعَائِرِ اللَّهِ As Safa is known to be a little hill in the beginning of the Sa'i, after you do the Tawaf in Mecca, around the Kaaba, you turn to what is called a Sa'i. This is a Rukn, which means a pillar of Umrah, and it's also a pillar for Hajj. So in a Sa'i, you start off a point that's called a Safa. A Safa, to enter to a Safa, there is an, a, a line between the black stone and a Safa. It is an, an angel line that points to the place where a Safa starts. A Safa is a little hill where our mother Hajar, alayhi salam, started to run in search for water for herself and for her baby Ismail when they ran out of water. She was just scrambling for anything that can point her to any place for water. On the seventh round, and that's where we finish the Sa'i, on the seventh round, Ismail السلام, kicked the floor with his feet and the spring of Zamzam started to gush out. And uh, this is where the Al Marwa is. It's called Marwa from Rawa Yarwi, which means to give water to. This is where Ismail was left, and this is where she picks him up and gives him water. So Al Safa is one hill, Al Marwa is the opposite hill, or this, the hill on the opposite side. And the sa'i or haste walking is between the two hills. So the ayah is saying, إِنَّ الصَّفَى وَالْمَرْوَةَ مِنْ شَعَائِرِ اللَّهِ Running between the safa and the marwa is part of the rituals that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made part of the uh, sa'i because it reminds us of so many lessons and so many things. Number one, the trust that Hajar had in her heart that Allah will never let her and her baby down. The trust that she had also in Prophet Ibrahim, her husband, that when he says this is from Allah, that she believed him and she trusted him. And she trusted Allah to deliver her and her baby. I want you to pay attention. Do you know what this trust means? This is not a husband leaving his wife in a hotel. 
It's not exactly five star. He is leaving her in a barren desert, empty desert. No humans, no animals, no plants. Not only that, no water. So this level of trust is so much counterintuitive to any human who does not believe in Allah. But for her being a believer and having traveled with Ibrahim before, having been educated by none other than Ibrahim, her husband, السلام, she learned to trust Allah and she believed Allah. Whatever he promises, she would be willing to live with. <coughs> so, haste walking between as safa and Al-Marwa is part of the rituals of both Umrah and Hajj. Okay? Rituals means a way of worship that is designated by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Hajj, وَمَنْ يُعَظِّمْ شَعَائِرَ اللَّهِ فَإِنَّهَا مِنْ تَقْوَى الْقُلُوبِ It is a sign of the taqwa in the heart to glorify the rituals that Allah has made mandatory or even recommended us to do. So here it comes. فَمَنْ حَجَّ الْبَيْتَ أَوْ اعْتَمَرَ فَلَا جُنَاحَ عَلَيْهِ أَنْ يَطَّوَّفَ بِهِمَا He who makes hajj to the house, meaning the house of Allah, which we call Al-Masjid Al-Haram. Al-Masjid Al-Haram in Mecca. أَوْ اَعْتَمَرَ And he who makes umrah in that place or to that place, فَلَا جُنَاحَ عَلَيْهِ أَنْ يَطَّوَّفَ بِهِمَا Al-Tawaf has two meanings. It could be circulating around something. It could also mean reaching between two points. Like for example, if I start walking to the boy's side here, and then move to the girl's side here, and then move back to your side, back and forth, the Arabs would say, يطوف, which means he goes one side one time, he goes the other side the other time. Okay? Tawaf also means to go around something fixed. That also is called tawaf. فَلَا جُنَاحَ عَلَيْهِ أَيْ يَطَّوَّفَ بِهِمَا That he would make tawaf uh, from al-safa to al-marwa. وَمَنْ تَطَوَّعَ خَيْرًا And he who does any voluntary extra worship فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ شَاكِرٌ عَلِيمٌ Allah is definitely grateful and all-knowing. What does it mean? It means whenever you volunteer any type of worship or charitable act or good deed and you volunteer doing it for the sake of Allah, when the Quran says Allah is always grateful, it means Allah will pay you and he will pay you handsomely. Because normally when you do something good for someone, he ought to be grateful. He ought to show you gratitude. How do we show gratitude to each other? Either we say thank you or we return your gift for a gift from our side. Or reward your act by something that we do to serve you or to help you. So when Allah is the one who is grateful, just let your imagination, imagination fly as far as it goes as to what the reward would be, what his reciprocation would be like. فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ شَاكِرٌ is one thing which is grateful. Ali means he knows it all. So you don't need to remind Allah of your good deeds. You don't need to remind Allah of your good deeds. Then it goes on to another subject. إِنَّ الَّذِينَ يَكْتُمُونَ مَا أَنزَلْنَا مِنَ الْبَيِّنَاتِ وَالْهُدَى Indeed, those who conceal what we have sent down of clear evidence, proof,
proofs and miracles and guidance those who conceal do you know the word conceal anybody hide. hide thank you very much so those who hide what we have sent down what did Allah send down Allah sent down the Quran right and what is in the Quran guidance and mercy and miracles and in instructions what is halal what's haram we refer to the Quran to learn that if I give you a gift for you and your family is it fair that you take it for yourself and don't share it with the family and if you want to do this what do we call this if you conceal it huh? being selfish thank you because when Allah gives me a gift of his mercy in the form of the book the Quran and he gave me the gift to learn it and to understand it then I owe it to everybody that I know to explain it to them otherwise I will be counted as concealing the truth concealing the guidance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and this is betrayal of trust so when I learn anything I do not keep it just to myself so let us talk about the Quran as a book of guidance and what it means to learn it and to communicate it and propagate it to others this is not about knowledge transfer only this is about as much as you protect yourself from hellfire when you learn and practice the Quran you owe it to your friends to also give them the guidance so that they are equally protected or they have the chance to protect themselves okay they have the chance to protect themselves by following the guidance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so let us listen carefully those who conceal or hide out hide away what we have sent down of guidance and clear evidence after we have made it clear to people in the book those will get nothing but the curse of Allah the wrath of Allah and they will be cursed by those who curse I want you to pay attention to this statement somebody learned the Quran and he understands what the ayat are really saying and he knows what it means and he is practicing it now he sees a friend doing something against the Quran against what he has already learned from the Quran what does he owe it to his friend he owes it to his friend boy or girl young or old to tell them this is what I learned from the Quran you cannot do this because it's a violation of Allah's order somebody is telling you <coughs> well come and play and then have fun and you can learn any other time is this a true friend why these are not your best friends these are people who want you to be like them leave what is helpful and beneficial and go to enjoy yourself your time your gathering your friendship go have some laughter and leave knowledge for some other time which means they want you to leave what is more important to what is less much less important okay we're not saying that playing is haram but <coughs> praying is better than praying right if Allah tells us in the Adhan in Fajr that prayer is better than sleeping sleeping is a basic necessary human need right 
like eating and drinking, you must rest. But Allah is saying, when it is Fajr time, you will benefit more from prayer than continuing to sleep and missing the prayer. When somebody says, well, but you can pray within one hour. Because Fajr is from the Adhan time until sunrise. There is one hour. You don't have to do it right in the beginning. And you don't have to do it right in the masjid either. Then if you listen to them, you have flipped what Allah is saying. You have given priority and importance to your sleep. As if sleep is more beneficial than prayer. You understand now? That becomes concealing the guidance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In this instance, it's concealing by action. So there is concealing by not saying it. And there is concealing by not doing what you're supposed to do at the time you should be doing it. Okay? So here it says, what do they get, these people who hide and conceal what Allah has sent down? They get Allah's curse. And then it says, وَيَلْعَنُهُمْ أَلَّاعِنُونَ And they will be cursed by the cursors. Who are the cursors? The cursors are either people who curse or angels who are cursing the people who violate willfully the commands of Allah. So we are not living alone. We are living with other creatures and creations around us. So ayah number 160, it says, إِلَّا الَّذِينَ تَابُوا وَأَصْلَحُوا وَبَيَّنُوا So the only ones who will not receive that kind of curse are the people who would repent, number one. وَأَصْلَحُوا Correct. Number three. And clear out. وَبَيَّنُوا They explain what the guidance of Allah is in the matter in question. So to avoid the curse of Allah and the curse of the cursors, one has to clarify and promote and communicate the message of Allah to others and if he has fallen in concealment of anything like this then they must correct the first step for correction is to make repentance to repent the second step is to correct what you have done wrong so if you concealed it from a friend or two then they must be the ones you go after to tell them, I'm sorry, I should have told you that this was wrong. What you've done last night, it was wrong. Because Allah says so and so and so and so. Then you have cleared the guidance of Allah and shared it with others. Then it says, those are the ones that I accept their repentance. And I am the one, Allah saying, I am the one who accepts repentance. And I am the one who is the most merciful. Then the following ayah, those are the ones who conceal. Let us listen about others. Those who have denied the message of Allah, they refuse to believe. Inna ladina kafaru. And died as kuffar. They died without ever believing in the message of Allah. What do they get? Alayhim la'natullah. They have the wrath of Allah, the anger, the wrath, the severe punishment of Allah, and the angels, and the whole of humanity. Amazing. Why would all of humanity? curse a person or a group of persons who live refusing to believe and die without believing. Why? Isn't this a choice that Allah has given them? And they have exercised their choice, right? But because their life has become the epitome 
of disobedience to Allah. The epitome, the encouragement, their life was a role model for disbelievers who want to communicate nothing but everything against faith, belief, and leading a peaceful life. Why do people curse them? It is not that they stand in a corner and curse, but when people find that those ones are the ones who misled them, then they start cursing at them. When they know that those who set themselves up as role models and in the capacity of being role model, they were disbelievers, atheists, or anyone who refuses the message of Allah after it has been presented to them in a clear, complete, and convincing way. Ayah number 162 They will be therein in that curse for eternity. خَالِدِينَ فِيهَا لَا يُخَفَّفُ عَنْهُمُ الْعَذَابَ The torment and the punishment will never be made lighter for them. وَلَا هُمْ يُنْظَرُونَ and they will never be given a respite. They will never be given a break from hellfire and the torment of hellfire. May Allah protect us all from hellfire. Then, ayah number 163. wahid. This is a message to the entire humanity. And your Lord, your God, the one that you should worship, all of you, is just one God. Ilahun Wahid. So it's not three, it is not more, and it is not none. There is God, and there is only one true God who deserves to be worshipped and to be listened to. When Allah says ilahukum ilahun wahid, He is pointing us that there is a binding force for all of us to work together, live together, and cooperate together. That we are all servants of His. We serve the cause of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we follow the guidance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When we say ilahun wahid also, it means we should never listen to anyone else when this ilah is talking to us. You should never be distracted from the Quran. And distraction is not only to listen and pay attention. That is part of it. You should listen, you should pay attention. But at the same time, distraction could be that you do not practice what you know. You do not teach what you know. That also can be a distraction. So when he says, Ilahukum ilahun wahid, also it means that we all humans have one reference to judge between us, which is Allah. So how could Allah judge between us in this life? We know that Allah will judge between us in the hereafter. How does Allah judge between us in this life, it is through his book that he has sent down. So when we dispute any matter, we should go back to the Quran. We should go back to the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. Our relationships should be established on the fact that Allah is our reference. And he is the only reference in our life that we cannot take for granted and we can never overlook what he says is serious, final, and effective. Meaning, it is serious, it will affect our life. It is final. Allah doesn't you know, second guess himself, nor should anybody second guess Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it's effective, it means it will influence our life. One way or the other. If you obey Allah, there will be an impact. If you disobey Allah, there will be another type of impact. But the word of Allah will always be carried out. So we have to be careful. When we read the Quran, 
that we take the word of Allah seriously. In Surah At-Tariq, which I believe many of you memorize it, it says about the Quran, إِنَّهُ لَقَوْلٌ فَصْلٌ This is a decisive statement, a decisive speech, because it comes from the ultimate power from Allah. وَمَا هُوَ بِالْهَزْلِ It is not a joke. Some people, you know, joke about the ayat of Allah and make, you know, make themselves laugh by making comments that uh, try to solicit laughter. This is haram. The word of Allah, Allah says, is serious and decisive. It is not a joke. So we should never make a fun of the word of Allah or the word of the Prophet for that matter. Okay? So, وَإِلَهُكُمْ إِلَهٌ وَاحِدٌ also means He is the only one around whose words we can be united as humans. If we do not all submit to His word, we can never be united. But if we all believe in His word, all try to learn it, all try to practice it, and let those who learn more be our leaders, in education and in guidance, then if we do this, we will be saved. But there is no other way that we could be saved if we violate the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَإِلَاهُكُمْ إِلَاهٌ وَاحِدٌ لَا إِلَاهَ إِلَّا هُ There is no God other than He. Which means what? Don't look elsewhere for guidance. So, your Lord is one Lord, and there is no Lord, there is no God but He. La ilaha illa hu. As if someone, just to, not to compare, but to, to illustrate the, the, the point, as if someone tells you, Brother Yusuf is going to be your teacher. And for this year, you will have no other teacher but him. Because, what? He can teach you math, he can teach you physics, he can teach you science, he can teach you history, he can teach you anything you want. He has taught it. Right? We believe definitely that Allah has all the knowledge that we will ever need or can have. Right? So, being ilah wahid means he is the ultimate and most powerful source of knowledge and there is no comparison between him and any of his creation. And where it says la ilaha illa hu, it means there is no supreme, there is no one super, there is no one God other than him. Which means he is the only one that we need to have as a reference. And then it says, Ar-Rahman, Ar-Rahim, the merciful, the compassionate one, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Which means, if we want mercy in this life, go to him. You want mercy for the hereafter, you go to him. You want to know what to do to deserve his mercy, go to his words. You want to know how to apply his word in your life, he says, go to the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa and follow his way. If you want to be what Allah likes to see of you, follow the Quran and follow the model of the Prophet. What else do we need? That's all what we need. If we want his mercy, if we want to learn what do we need to know and do, he is our source. Then the ayah number 164 will turn into the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. See, the ayah says that Allah is the only God, right? Ayah 164 will tell us what did he do for us to see him and him alone as not only a God, but as the only God. 
So this ayah will talk about this. Indeed, in the creation of heavens and earth, and the variations of night, the night and the day, and the ships that run on the surface of the ocean, with whatever benefits people, and whatever Allah has sent down from heaven of water that he revived the earth with after it was arid, dry, and cracked, and he has spread in it, meaning in the earth, from every living walking beast, and the delineation and the movement of wind, of clouds, that is suspended and subjected and stabilized between the earth and the heaven. Who's holding those clouds? Those clouds that you see flying from one place to another. Who's holding them? Allah. The one who's holding those clouds is the one who's holding the earth in its orbit. The one who's holding the sun and directing it to its destiny. All are similarly controlled by one and the same power. Allah. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is giving us a display of his power. The power of creation, the power of guidance, the power of control. The power of creation that he has created heavens and earth. Right? And he created the day and the night. Right? And he made the night a time for rest and recouping your power rejuvenating your health mentally, emotionally and physically and it is he who sent water to revive the earth and revive everything revivable on the surface of the, of the earth of planets, humans, animals birds, fish everything so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is giving us a full portrait of his power, the power of creation, the power of guidance, and the power of control. He creates everything and gives everything its properties and its nature. الذي أعطى كل شيء خلقه ثم هدى The power of guidance. That Allah has created everything, gave it a specific nature, and guided it to do what it is supposed to do. So from the point of creation of the earth, Allah gave it a certain nature. It is solid on the surface and cool. It is very hot in the middle, in the core of the earth, right? It is stable in the surface as if you walk on its surface, you could walk for your life. And it never ends. Why? Because it's a globe. It is not flat. Anything flat has an edge at the end. Right? But if you hold a ball, where does it end? You keep rotating it. It will never end. Right? So the earth, the Quran, points to us that it is created spherical. It is not flat. Right? Who gave it that nature? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The planets and the stars you see in the day or in the night in the skies are like an open book. And on the day of judgment, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will fold it like you would fold a book. Could you imagine this? You know those ball decorations that you hang in the, in the ceiling? You don't buy them as balls from the store. You buy them as paper that is stuck together. Then you open it and keep unfolding. When it wraps around, it forms a spherical shape, like a ball, right? And when you fold it back, it finishes as a flat, like a book. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says about the heavens, يَوْمَ نَطْوِ السَّمَاءَ 
كطي السجل للكتب on that day we will fold the skies or the heavens right the samawat will fold it as you would fold the pages of a book when you open it it displays a lot of stars zillions of stars right and when you close it the world becomes completely dark that's the day of judgment may Allah protect us from everything difficult in this life and in the hereafter so indeed in the creation of heavens and earth and the variation of night and day these days these days the length of the day is almost the same at, as the length of the night right so sunrise is about seven sunset is about five something and it gets closer the day gets longer until they are equally 12 hour on each side and then the night starts to become shorter and shorter and the day becomes the longest and then they start rotating the night becomes longer and the day becomes shorter right and you see this and the most amazing thing i personally noticed is how the same earth has different seasons divided by the equator you know the equator those who studied geography right equator is a line that separates the north of the earth into the northern sphere and the south as the southern sphere right uh, about 1988 i was invited for a Supreme Court case in Cape Town, South Africa. And please pray for Cape Town. Cape Town is running out of water. When we say it is running out of water, we are really talking about a city that houses about two, three million people. It's a full-fledged, very beautiful city. And it is running completely out of water the date the date that they set as the deadline for the availability the availability of water from natural sources is going to be april 22nd 2017 which is few months from now hmm? no 2018 i'm sorry so somebody's waking up thank you so Three months from now, Cape Town will not have. Anyway, the point is, when, uh, when I was going, it was February. Okay? So what do you take when you travel in February? You take winter clothing, right? So I wrapped all my winter stuff, coats and this and this, and I land there, and two shocking surprises because I didn't pay attention. That was one of my first flights to the Southern Sphere. So, uh, two things happened. My bag didn't come with me. And it was hot summer winter. You see, it's just surprise. If you travel in the southern of the equator, like in uh, Latin America and beyond, uh, you see the same phenomenon. If you are winter here, it is summer there. If it is summer here, it's winter there. So the differences that Allah infused in His creation are so amazing. So amazing. So in any way, the lost bag was a blessing for me because all that I have to buy are summer clothing, which is light. And the bag came after I had departed, so I didn't need to carry anything. But the problem is, I needed to buy a winter coat to come back with, still in February. <laughs> in any way. So, the difference is not only spread between night and day, it is not split also between the summer where you live and the winter where you live. It is also split between 
what you get if you are in the southern hemisphere vis-a-vis -vis if you are in the northern hemisphere those are phenomena that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is drawing our attention to واختلاف الليل والنهار اختلاف الليل والنهار also is in the light the day is lit and the night is dark that's another difference uh, scholars tell us I'm talking about science they tell us that the best time that you must be in your deep sleep for your body mind and soul to recover from all the stress of the day is between one o'clock in the morning until Salat al-Fajr which means you don't need to be sleeping after Salat al-Fajr and to get to the deep sleep you must sleep hours earlier so that when one o'clock gets in you are in deep sleep most of us especially youth like me we like don't laugh we like to spend the night up and this is a bad habit this is a bad habit and at your age at my age and your age we all must sleep at times certain to give the body the mind and the soul the ability to recover from whatever stress we have gone through uh, in the day then it goes on and the ships that run in the sea with whatever benefits people and whatever Allah sent down from heaven of water that he uses to revive the land and revive the earth after it has been dead and he spreads in it from every type of beast every, every type of beast and in the control of the winds and the clouds that are suspended and subjected to our benefit suspended between heaven and earth what is in those Allah says لآيات لقوم يعقلون in every one of those phenomena in every one of those creations of Allah there are signs and miracles which means as if Allah is opening the book of creation for us and telling us go study learn how do these things function how do they operate how do they serve you how could you make the best use out of everything because everything is created and subjected to our utility we are the best of the creations of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in that all creations are coerced they don't have a free will but we do have a free will and when do we become the best when we are choosing what Allah chose for us over what we desire part of our creation as humans is that Allah created us with desires we like certain things we hate certain things we like milk that's natural and we hate sour and bitter and intoxicating drinks that's part of our nature except if we twist our nature nature and force it to deal with things we should not okay so Allah is saying look for those ayat and submit to the one who created those miracles and subjected all of those things for you Allah has created us and he has given us dignity and honor in this life وَلَقَدْ كَرَّمْنَا بَنِي آدَمْ وَحَمَلْنَاهُمْ فِي الْبَرِّ وَالْبَحْرِ We have carried them over in the land and in the sea وَرَزَقْنَاهُمْ مِنَ الطَّيِّبَاتِ And we provided them with good things See how Allah is throwing things into our hands and around us in the creation so that we learn and benefit and see the magnificent works that Allah has done for us even before our creation Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says لَخَلْقُ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ أَكْبَرُ مِنْ خَلْقِ النَّاسِ you see you think that you are a miracle 
as a creation, and you are. But Allah is telling us the creation of heavens and earth is greater than the creation of man. In the eyes of Allah, the creation of heavens and earth is greater in the eyes of Allah than our most magnificent form of creation. So Allah wants to tell us what? He wants to tell us, humble yourself. Respect the miracles that Allah has infused in all of his creations, including yourself. Roam the earth and search for those miracles and see how best you can grow the earth that Allah has gifted you with, which you didn't know and you didn't have, and you were not there when the earth was created, right? So Allah is telling us, pay attention to those miracles. How much time do we have? Four minutes, hmm? Four minutes. okay. So after ayah 164, ayah number 165, it says, وَمِنَ النَّاسِ As if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us, please look and see. With all of those miracles and evidence and signs from Allah, some people take partners from creations other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Despite their knowledge of Allah, they take part of his creation as gods, as equals to God. And they love them as much as Allah ought to be loved. There is a certain type of love that is dedicated only to Allah. Allah is the only one that we love. I want you to hear this loud and clear. Allah is the only one we should love unconditionally all else there are conditions even your parents even your parents the closest after Allah to you are your parents then you should never let your love of your parents be a competition against Allah over your heart Never. وَإِنْ جَاهَدَاكَ عَلَىٰ أَنْ تُشْرِكَ بِي مَا لَيْسَ لَكَ بِهِ عِلْمٍ فَلَا تُطِعْهُمَا If your parents tell you to do something against the guidance of Allah, Allah says, do not obey them. Whom should I obey? Allah. When should I obey my parents? If they tell me to do something, that is not in contradiction with what Allah is telling me. Let me be a little bit more uh, detailed in this issue. Does this mean if I spread my prayer rug and my mom calls me before I enter the prayer, should I say, oh, now, no, she is going to be a distraction I will just pray and then later on answer her call. No, you answer her first. But if you enter into a prayer and you hear your mom or dad calling, should you leave the prayer? Yes, you should if the prayer is sunnah. See how much important parents are. If it is sunnah, yes, you leave your prayer because your mom or dad may need something urgent. You see the importance of parents? They can call you out of your prayer, yes, but only if it is sunnah. If it is fard, you complete your fard. Why? The fard is an obligatory prayer mandated by Allah and it is the minimum for my salvation. But sunnah gives you an extra grade, right? Extra points. And you could always make it up later. But fard has a time limit. Do you understand the difference? And you understand the importance of parents. Okay? So what does it mean then when Allah says, 
if they call you to associate anyone with Allah, never obey them. It means if they call you to worship another God, disobey them. That's what the Quran is saying. But so long as they are calling you to do what is right, you must listen to them. Aisha? Okay. So we will stop at ayah number 164. And inshallah next time we will pick on ayah 165, Surah Al-Baqarah. Subhanak Allahum wa hamdik. Nashadu an la ilaha illa ant. Nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk. Yes. Barakallahu.